we are actually interviewing somebody from Switzerland this time, and it would be Roman Werner. Hello, Roman. Hi. Glad to talk to you finally. Actually, it's not our first encounter. We actually got to know each other due to Gamescom. That's right, yes. This year. Very um, funny. Yes. Um, so, you are mainly known for having worked on games basically on the Amiga for Starbite, for example. I think your first commercial project was um, a music piece for Leonardo. Uh, maybe uh, Eliminator was first, but Leonardo just came afterwards. That's okay. right, yeah. Because on your plug, you say that uh, Leonardo was the first. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I think I, I made it, uh, you know, uh, um, a new timeline for myself for today, just for the occasion. <laughs> and I, I worked it out. Maybe I have to update my my blog. So, yes, maybe uh, it's uh, probably my mistake. I took it not so seriously the first time. <laughs> so yeah. how did that actually start that you got into computers and all that stuff? Um, that's uh, that started in. 1983, I guess. Well, first I got like like many other people from that time um, got a pong machine from like a pong game. My father took that home, uh, and I spent like hours, no days, weeks with my cousin playing that game. And uh, yeah, for for me, it's just like getting control over the pixel was such a such an excitement. It was really cool. Um, yeah, and then there came the, the time with the um, the WIC-20 mm -hmm. and uh, shortly after the C64. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's this something, uh, a story for itself, um, how we met in the um, shopping centers and typed in endless days uh, on those uh, machines because it was too expensive to afford such a um, such a uh, Commodore 64 or Vic 20. Nevertheless, I, I uh, talked my mother into it and said, well, I, I need one of those computers. I mean, it's uh, everybody's story, you know, it's you need it for school, whatever. And um, then I got uh, the present on Christmas Day and it was a Vic 20. <laughs> so it was a disappointment. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the because I was version. already like on the C64 line and uh, said, well, it is much superior over the Big 20. So uh, we went back and returned it. And then I got the C64 uh, shortly after, but without um, any uh, disk drive, without any tape, nothing to save it. So this is my first experience with, uh, with the Commodore 64 and just typing endless listings, playing it for maybe two hours and then switching it off and then, you know, starting it from scratch. I couldn't save the, the, wow. the list, the, the program. But you got into it, you know, you got into programming, you got into like um, finding your own mistakes. It uh, was a great time, yes. Making the listing shorter so next time you don't have to spend so much time typing it in? <laughs> Are you referencing to my 10 liners, maybe? <laughs> That's a big jump forward. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, so, it comes did you from get a data time. set at some point, or did you stay? Did you start straight with the disk drive? Um, I never had a, a data set. Eh? Uh, data set. Uh, I think I got a disk drive. And I, I went to um, earn that money. I went to clean uh, schoolhouses for uh, autumn holiday to get that money. So it was well, well earned. And um, yeah, I was very proud to have it now. Yeah, it was a big relief. How is how was it in Switzerland? Were the prices similar to what you got, what you would get the Commodore sixty four in Germany, or? Um, um... I remember it. Uh, it was seven hundred ninety nine francs, Swiss francs. So, um, yeah, I think it was about the same. I mean, the D-Mark was, was a bit cheaper. But was a uh, yeah, incredible price for a Christmas present at the time, of course. Yeah, but because everybody had one that uh, everybody had to <laughs> put money aside for that. It was, a, it was an extremely interesting, um, you know, time to to uh, to to get into a new technology yeah. for many people it was actually um, difficult because the disk drive was 
almost more, more expensive than the Commodore 64 itself because yes. the 1541 was actually essentially a computer. I mean, it had a, it had a CPU, it had it had RAM. It was basically a computer. Yes, I mean, probably nobody tried to see it that way, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, from the cost side, yeah, I mean, it was quite uh, astonishing that the disk drive sold so well uh, f for such a high price, where, you know, Jack Jamil said, uh, um, computer for the masses, and the disk drive wasn't certainly not for the masses. <laughs> and then you started with gaming, like, like most people, and then discovered through... Um, the cracks, the cracking scene. How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, the changing exchanging programs was kind of, uh, you know, the time uh, how you did it to learn more, uh, you know, to to, to have fun uh, on little money. Um, I don't know how it actually uh, happened that, I mean, you, you get together, you build a group, and then you you start trying to get into the code and, you know, analyzing what's going on. And and so it happened that, uh, um, and that the hacker scene was also uh, very strong at that time. You know, war games just came into the cinemas, that, that story about the Cold War. 84, I think it was. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, actually, I wrote it down. <laughs> but, yeah, War Games uh, was do, 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 nine, uh, 83. 83, uh, yeah. yeah I, no, I, actually, it, it, it was uh, uh, very, uh, I remember it very well, uh, because it was actually the autumn where I went into the, sh the, the shopping centers to program, and it was just a time of that. Uh, <laughs> Want to play a game? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. How can I talk? It's not a real voice. Uh, this box just interprets signals from the computer and turns them into sound. Shall we play a game? Oh. <laughs> I think I missed them. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Yeah. Love to. How about global thermonuclear war? Wouldn't you prefer a good game of chess? <laughs> And you know, you can imagine now today, but Star Wars, before it was a, a thing, I was 10 years old, got into the cinema. It was uh, 1977, yeah, I came into cinema and uh, sneaked in, you know, it, I was too young to see that. And then watching, seeing that like big story of, uh, um, yeah, the, the space opera, more or less. Uh, it was such a, such a, Good start of, of a great time in the 80s is just unbelievable still is. Um, yes, but back to the um, swapper scene, cracker scene. Uh, yes, the hackers scene. Um, yeah, people started to buy modems or like these uh, acoustic coupler. A, a friend invited me to his home and showed me, you know, that the cool thing, how to can, can log into a, a, a built-in board system, BBS. And uh, then you you do 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 and beep, you know the thing that um, makes it so characteristic. And then yeah, I had I, he wanted to uh, an open an account for me and ask me for a nickname. You know this is always the first time when you come into situation you you need to think of a name. And I looked around saw our, um, a flag on his wall uh, of New York and it was Big Apple. So I chose that um, that nickname uh, for my like hacker, uh, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> um, that's for like a, that, that, that's for like the start of that that uh, name. And so yeah, it evolved uh, with um, with getting friendly with other people, and and then I came into other um, clever uh, guys. One is Christian Weber, um, and his his brother. And uh, yeah, I mean they. Um, they were already familiar or uh, like doing swapping big in a big style uh, in Switzerland or in Europe um, under the name Swiss Cracking Association. And uh, so, you know, it was like uh, being kind of a passive member of that group. It was really, uh, yeah, kind of cool. Yeah. It's actually the same group that was famous later on for having um, coded the first... Amiga virus. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, but um, yeah, it, it's kind of escaped. Uh, <laughs> and I, I only knew about that until I had it myself. <laughs> so that was Christian's work. And he's, he was... Uh, he was just trying to prove to a friend, he's a, a like a uh, IT uh, student, and he tried to prove that uh, a boot block virus could be possible. And they say, no, it's not. And so, uh, or like after a, a, re a soft reboot, that it would st survive. And he wanted to prove the opposite. And so, it just out of a you know feeling, he he made that virus, and um, then. Yeah, he, he swapped it with friends just to, you know, make them laugh or so and, and, and escaped and it went went worldwide. And I read somewhere that um, almost or about 40% of every Omega use, uh, user is had, had the Swiss cracking associate, the SCA virus, uh, somehow, sometimes. Um, I'm not happy with it. I mean, it's not something that you can pr be proud of, of course. Um, but yeah, it just shows how um, uh, how things can go wrong in a way. Yeah. Um, but you could get rid of it in the long run somehow, I hope. Uh, yes, I mean, Christian himself wrote uh, antivirus. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the <laughs> typical way of you create the virus and then you create the antivirus and then you name yourself Kapersky. Oh, I, no, I don't want to say any name. Uh, uh, there are many <laughs> antivirus companies. Uh, they do a very good job. Um, no, but uh, also you could you could delete the virus by clicking the I think left mouse button before you start up, and then it will not um, um, start the virus. And so you can format your disk and uh, yeah. Uh, but just by accident, I I found an article from about Jim Sachs on the internet. Jim Sachs was a very famous or. Uh, um, designer, like, uh, a graphic designer, graphic artist for Defender of the Crown, for example, or um, other products from Cinemaware. And he did beautiful artwork for Amiga pictures. So Jim Sass is a name that, that uh, people know. Uh, yeah, Amiga. interestingly, the press back in the day said that the graphics of Defender of the Crown were photorealistic. <laughs> and 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 this on um, even on the Commodore 64. Um, so it's interesting <laughs> what was uh, seen as photorealistic um, back in the in the 80s. Yeah. Yes, I mean it's uh, it's it was mind blowing at the time, just to see the that beautiful um, graphics possible. And uh, I started with the Amiga Thousand. Uh, it was terribly expensive by then, but um, yeah, I remember seeing that Defender of the Crown uh, running on the Amiga 1000 in my bedroom. It was just unbelievable. And the system seller, of course. Yeah. But Jim Sachs, uh, he wrote, so he, he mentioned apparently that he was working on a new project called uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, you know, the Shul Verne story. Um, made a lot of uh, artwork already on several discs. And then the, as apparently the SCA virus hit, and he lost all his work. I mean, it's only writing into the boot block, so it can't really destroy um, disks or so. But from his point of view, he lost it all and lost interest in it, and that's why it never happened. Oh, that's really that's pretty pretty, pretty tough. bad. Oh god. But he went with, with the same design to Disney later. And uh, then, but it was already too late, uh, it, maybe two years or so later, and it was too late um, because uh, I think 3D uh, technology already started and his design was a bit like old fashioned maybe for the time. So Disney uh, um, yeah, rejected the, the investment. I think it was quite a lot of money he, he uh, planned to invest in it. But yeah, um, that's the story about uh, SCA virus, more or less. Interesting that on your blog you you mostly write only about Amiga or Atari stuff. Uh, you never did really much activity on the Commodore 64 in the scene. Uh, I cracked a few games. I mean, just like after it was like already uh, in everybody's um, portfolio, uh, I, I cracked a game for myself, just to see if I can do it. 
put my name in it and uh, that was it more or less. Uh, it was more, you know, playing the games and uh, yeah, learning how games work, the games mechanics and becoming more interesting, uh, interested in, uh, you know, how, how do they do it and uh, uh, why why is it fun and why is it not fun and, and just working out, um, yeah, maybe, maybe games design in a passive way. Uh, you know? Actually, you are known to be one of those people that can do a little bit of everything, like code, graphics, and music. Yeah, I mean, I'm not good in like great in every angle, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's good enough that I can bring everything together and make like one uh, one uh, product that um, you know works together. Because if you have a team that works on graphics, you have to interact a lot with those and say what you want, and then they don't understand what you need. And so, if you can do it yourself, it's really helpful that uh, that you can just um, and and I also admire people who make a game uh, on their own. Uh, just for example, um, I mean, you know him, Tseho, Christian Gleinsner. Uh, Gleinsner. Uh, he's uh, uh, Shadow Switcher or the the, the frogs game that he made uh it's like a one-man product and and i think it's so cool that someone can do that and <laughs> and make make a and this is always my my dream from from little um to bring a product into a store you know to see it on the shelf or to make something that people can buy uh so that that was my my drive i think to to go further but I've read that your love for production of, of games and so on, it started by a synthesizer. For, yes, yes. Yeah. In which you um, found a reason to make music for computers. Yeah, I mean, th this is actually the, the door how I got into the um, actual software business. Because uh, my friend, uh, Rudi Huckentobler, um, I uh, we went to the same uh, apprenticeship, uh, the same job. We met there, and he had like a whole his whole home full of synthesizers, and was uh, into music, and you know learned the stuff from the ground. And we just we were just playing around with the DX7, Roland D50, um, you know, I mean everything. What had a name then? I think he had it. It was like really cool uh, experimentation feel, and somehow. Um, when later, when, when we started our team, our group of people in Switzerland, um, playing around with, uh, with making actual products, like, uh, the, the sound effects, uh, I, I want to name here that came out by Linel, or I think it never came out, but it, it was a design from Christian Haller, like, a um, a soundtrack that he made for Amiga. And I think the first or the, the only one that worked with the, on the directly on the um, operating system, um, they needed sounds for that uh, tracker. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I can help out. If we can, and we spent hours or the days uh, trying to um, digitize those synthesizer sounds um, from from then. So that's how how we built the, the library uh, for sound effects. And then I started to play, you know, uh, around with that, with the tracker. And then I started to make a, a few sounds. And then Markus Krimer from Linel came and said, Oh, Roman, well, that's, uh, I heard this from Christian Haller. Um, would you be able to create some music for, for that, some demo sounds, songs? And I said, Yeah, sure, no problem. And um, so it just, um, one, one came after the other. And I had fun making, you know, um, music. And uh, I'm, I'm not so good with drums, but I, I like harmonics, and uh, that that uh, really suited me. And yeah, it's, uh, that's then turned into the Leonardo music. I know that's that's what is mentioned at the beginning. Um, actually, I think the Leonardo music I. I uh, composed before the game actually existed, and then they thought, uh, okay, that, that would probably match with the game, and uh, we can use it for that. 
So the Omega version was first, and then there came the uh, Commodore 64 version, because that is that was actually um, done by another person regarding the music. Uh, yes, it has nothing to do with me. Yeah. And uh, the funny thing, the first part of the Leonardo um, music, it's like the intro that goes quite a long way. And the cool story behind that is that I just called my friend, Rudy, and said, well, uh, I just need kind of a, you know, slow, um, yeah, you know, song to, to um, um, play with that scene. And um, he said, yeah, well, try that and try that. I mean, he knew, like, technically how, how you build that kind of music. And I said, oh, yeah, and just, and I think we spent two hours on the phone. And in the end, the whole song was was done just wow. by him telling me, yeah, that that could sound good. Just a rough uh, version of it. But that's that that really funny that, that that just came out. And the song is quite <clears throat> long in Leonardo, the, the starting song. Yeah. True. Yeah, actually, um, I remember Leonardo from the Commodore 64 because of this anim animated intro, you know, where the guy would would um, check out the house if, exactly, if there yeah. is somebody in, and then then um, then he would go there and crack the door open and then enter it and then mm -hmm. lighten some some lights, some windows in the house. That's uh, quite interesting. And they actually transfer, tra um, converted it well to the Commodore 64 minus the stepping sounds that you yes, get in the Amiga yeah. intro. And I think the song is a bit different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Also, in the, the in-game sound is uh, song is is different. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas uh, I think Clownomania was also converted later. Uh, another game I made the music for. Uh, that uh, I think they t they took the melody. Uh, from me, which which was quite cool. Interesting that you mentioned Exterminator. Um, I think it, uh, it was Eliminator. El Eliminator, yeah. Interesting. Eliminator was actually and the music was done by Jaruntel in the Netherlands for the, the C64 Commodore. version. Yeah. yeah, brilliant tune. Actually, you know, it's uh, he's, he's he's a really good, uh, a really real star. Uh, no, no, no question. And then the Atari ST version of Eliminator had such a, you know, was such, such a letdown regarding the music if you compare it to to the um, to the C64 version. But that wasn't done by um, um, uh, by yeah, uh, until. yeah, until, yeah. And uh, but because. This was a conversion to Atari ST, uh, so Linel was asked to to do the conversion for I guess good money, but you know limited time. And Christian Haller, Christian Weber, they both uh, um, looked at it and said, "Yeah, we can do it." And they I don't know literally like two days job. They converted the whole game onto the Amiga. I mean, unbelievable for me to to see this and. The, the, for the sound, um, Christian Weber wrote uh, um, an emulation of the music chip uh, on the Atari ST. Just like that, you know, it's just, you know, for me, it's still uh, crazy. And But the, the problem was that the sound was not at Amiga standard. So 
um, Marcus Krimmer came to me and said, oh, Roman, can you please, you know, uh, do something about that uh, for the intro at least. And then that was just like in the evening and I said, yeah, okay, when do you need it? And then he said, well, uh, I have to send the, 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 the final version tomorrow morning. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, yeah uh, go for it. And then I, I, um, I composed the, the evening, the, the night show, and then I think four o'clock in the morning, because I thought in, the, in, in my head, they're working like the, the whole night through as well. And then I gave them a call four o'clock in the morning, say, hey, listen, this is the song I made. And they just, whoa, not at this time, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that was a good, good thing for, for me. But yeah, I mean, it was just a rough, rough, uh, um, extension of the not very good mu music and the Eliminator in the Amiga version. So yeah, a bit, bit. Uh, I feel a bit sad for uh, for um, is it uh, John Phillips? Uh, you know the the creator of Eliminator because the game is really cool. Yeah, it is definitely, and I think um, the music plays a big part in the atmosphere of the game. Mm. And interestingly, when the DTV was released in 2004, I actually learned um, that in the NTSC version, they actually made a proper NTSC version with fixed music um, uh, timing and so on. And that was a variety back in the 80s for the Commodore 64 um, because many publishers and coder teams they wouldn't know about the difference of NTSC yeah. and PAL. So it yeah. um, was quite interesting that there was a, there's even a little graphic, a little icon on the left lower side of the game in the title screen where it says NTSC fixed. And so, <laughs> uh, and that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing for a commercial game that they even would, would make a little hint about it. You know, yeah. Um, so yeah, I can uh, totally relate to that. Yeah, I mean the speed of of, of sound uh, <clears throat> or, or the, the music on between the PAL and NTSC versions. I don't know how many songs I I remember or I know from uh, probably being too slow, right? That like make, games that were made in America on the mm. NTSC version and played in PAL. On the PAL, like one to one, it's it's slower, right? Yes, yes. And I guess we we all learned it the slow way and don't yes. even know how it would sound yeah. originally. Exactly. Yeah. The most famous example would be Summer Games from Epics. I guess yeah. that that's the most prominent example. Yeah. Another, another would be California Games, also from Epics. Everybody knows the intro music, but nobody knows in Europe how it's supposed to sound. Yeah, yeah. It's actually interesting because I once had an interview with Chris Crick, who was the sound um, manager of Epics, and he told me that they simply didn't know. Ah. That, is, <laughs> that is why they didn't fix it. <laughs> yeah, it's like a completely different time, uh, you know, with no internet and no... Uh, you know, knowledge about the other culture and, and uh, how things go. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that was a completely... Uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me when you say But that. you were lucky on the Amiga, especially the newer versions, you could s simply switch between the two standards. I don't remember anymore, but yeah, <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, that, uh, that's something they had, had thought about. Yeah. It was clever design too. 
And you also worked on, on other games. And actually, there's a story where you did your own game and it almost failed because Starbite went bankrupt. And you also wrote how they were trying to rip you off about the contract for making the game. Yes, uh, that's that's a big story. Uh, uh, lesson to learn story. story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, there was just one time that I uh, could go with the other guys, Christian Weber, Christian Haller, René Straub is also one that they did a lot of conversions, uh, mostly from Atari ST to Amiga. Rings of Medusa, for example, is one of the examples there. Um, also did some originals. But um, they were invited to the Christmas party to uh, in, in Bochum uh, at Starbite. And asked if I could come as well. And said yes, and they said, "Yeah, this 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 guy has a has made it like a a demo, a game that that he he's happy to show you." And so I went there with my uh, with my disc, and uh, yeah, it was winter time. It was like snowy. It was like a great atmosphere. Um, then the party happened, and then there was a moment where I could show the game, and they just said, "Hey, that's really cool." And uh, um, I think uh, that's something we want to 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 do with you. And uh, how long do you need to finish? And uh, so I just said, "Wow, no problem." It's you know, almost finished, eight months. And then they said, "Okay, let's just do a contract." And uh, the side story of that, I mean, that's that's something I wrote in the in the blog, uh, is that we we try to find a, a price that both uh, agree on and they were too low for me. I had some kind of expectations what the game should look like. And then we, we, we couldn't find each other. And so that was um, uh, Jürgen Kraft. He, he said, okay, that's enough. He took out a, a dice um, and said, okay, say even or odd numbers. Uh, and uh, if if it gets your number, um, then, or you, you, if you're even and you say even, then, then you get your, what you want, and otherwise uh, I get what I want. And so he throw the dice, and uh, lucky for me at the time, uh, I, I got my prize. So it was, I was over the moon. It was just like the best thing ever, you know, not even having like a contract, but also like had like a negotiation success. And so... Okay, luck is not a good help over there, but maybe the luck is on my side in the end, okay. I don't know. Anyway, uh, went home uh, with that uh, big uh, belief I can make it. Uh, started to to continue on the on the game there, and of course that was uh, I think the beginning of the the mid nineties. I should have finished it July ninety. It was the uh, end of eighty nine, maybe November eighty nine. Was it right? Just to get it, uh, yeah. The contract was done in 90 and 91. I should have uh, delivered, yeah, July 91. So um, I, I was completely behind, you know, schedule there and just said, okay, I have to do something. And then I got Orlando Peterman. Uh, Roland Peterman, he's, he's Orlando. He's like, uh, did all the graphics for um, the... the the group of people that we were, he was the the, the good designer. He, he knew his, his things, and I I then told him uh, or asked him if he could help out. And he just finished uh, with another project. Said yes, of course, but I want uh, to see some money. And he was also someone that knew that you know you're not always getting the money. And his contract was quite serious. And so, but I just said no, no, I want to do that. It's just really complete belief. And um, continued on that, and I guess I said another, another. Uh, by the end of the year, the game will be finished. End of ninety-one. It's actually called Traps and Treasures. Traps and Treasures, yes. Because yeah. we didn't mention the name yet, yeah, so and people that's... might might be wondering what are we talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, we can show a picture when we, sure. when we make it later, and um. um when he, I mean, I was working full time at that time, and it's just like taps and treasures happened in the evening and uh, in the bedroom, and uh, just 
trying to move things forward. Uh, but it, it, I just always wanted to put more things into it. And uh, my big achievement would have been to make a game of the month, something like that. It's just like <laughs> this <laughs> dream that you have to make a game that nobody else has made and working on it. Of course, I mean, the, the, um, the publisher wants to get the, the money. And uh, then they, in December, just before Christmas, uh 92 i'm not sure anymore but they sent me this this letter of of complaint or saying they they sue me for 200,000 deutschmark just like that bang and uh, i was completely um shocked by that you know because i was believing in my dream and naive uh, the, the way i was uh you know i i i knew i will finish it but they just want to, to, uh, wanted to see the money. Um, yeah, I mean, th that was just like a moment in time that I don't want to, to have again. So the contract said you had to finish the game in a certain time and you didn't? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then a new contract was made because, yes, um, Starbite went bankrupt. And because it was all like uh, I, I al already said that the, the game is theirs in a way in the contract, so it perished with the company. And as, uh, first I thought, well, I can go to you name it uh, Rainbow Arts and you know offer my game there, or like I'm free now. And uh, but no, no chance. It was just gone and just devastated that my my years of work have been, um, you know, um, have gone to nowhere. But then um, his wife, Brigitte, Brigitte Kraft, Rio, like started uh, another Starbite um, software uh, under a different name, slightly different name, under her name. And uh, just we made a new contract that was al always, uh, again, full of promises on their side. You know, they said, <laughs> well, well, we'll make you a Super NES cartridge and you get money from the cartridge and we get, you know, to, in, uh, well, I don't know, uh, countries and you will sell lots of. So I agreed to do, um, to be part of how many games you sell, you get uh, some money, like 50 cents per so sold uh, a copy, something like this, um, but of course never happened. You know that, uh, and yeah, it it was like handcuffs, uh, being handcuffed to to that company, and all of them, they were all the same. I mean, the, well, I'm talking about Linel and and Starbright. They they really knew how they they could uh, uh, give you a little bit, but take more from you and never pay you out, but I always say, well, if you want more, you, you have to do this uh, little job additional to that. And then, you know, it, it takes some time to get things done. Um, but then, then I think uh, just before the game was released, um, I I went to a lawyer because I, I, I knew it, you know, the game is going into the shops and I want to see my money. So I wanted a lawyer and they contacted Starbite and uh, we had some kind of agreement how it goes. Um, the agreement was that I sent them uh, the full version, but they should set, first send the, the money to me. So I get the money, they will get the master and then they can bring it into shops. And to prevent them from bringing the game into the shops, I just changed the uh, title screen like the, the last three months, I changed the title screen of the master or the, the last uh, copy, the well, last version I made, um, with like a uh, not, not original or something I put over the screen. So, but then um, when I was waiting for the money, someone called me and said, hey, Roman, your game is out. So great. Hey, thank you. Uh, I saw it in the shops and I said, what? what? That's, that, that's not possible, you know? And then they replaced it uh, um, because the, the final master was not made by me. That was made uh, um, by someone else. Um, he took a, a picture from the old copy, uh, put it together as the master, and then released it anyway. Yeah. Wow. So it was like the typical way of 
uh, not not seeing any money anymore. Uh, apart from you know the money that I had to pay for the for uh, Orlando, but that was well invested. That was no problem. Yeah, but um, yeah, it was was not cool. And then I went back to the lawyer, and you know that also cost money. In the end, I got something. I don't, didn't get the money that I uh, originally agreed. Uh, but I got some of it, and but that wasn't the, the incentive. It was like seeing the game in the shops. Uh, but what, what I was a bit uh, uh, disappointed is that they didn't do any advertisements in the magazines. Look, every game they brought out, they had some kind of uh, uh, full um, full page advertisements. Uh, traps and dashes, you won't find any. Anything. It's actually surprising me that Starbite went bankrupt. I mean, if you look at things like um, Soul Chris, um, yeah, Soul Crystal, um, Rolling Ronnie, and they, they had they had some very famous people there, like Veto, who did graphics also for them, and was actually high, uh, but actually was actually an original staff member from Starbite. So I'm I'm not sure, but I always thought. The games sold well. I can't say say much about it. I mean, um, they they were really big in in all these the Winter and uh, economy simulation. I think they had a big big uh, target market that they more or less reserved. Um, I don't know. Of course, the 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 copy scene was still strong. That you didn't sell that many and. Of traps and treasures, I mean, I in my contract I had an agreement that if they sell more than two thousand copies, then I will get a, a little bit more money. Um, the information they they, they sh showed me like fax from um, these shopping centers that ordered the copies, and in total it didn't go uh, beyond two thousand copies. Really? Oh, that's so sad. Yeah, it was a time where, you know, everybody, uh, uh, you know, a new game was cracked within a few minutes and or, or even before it was released and everybody had it. Uh, I mean, I'm not the only one. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it still was, was a good experience. I mean, it's, it's not that, um, that I feel bad about it. Uh, that, that people, I mean, people who have money, they pay for a product. And people who don't have money, they will never pay for a product. It's it's something that that yeah, um, you you just have to address the right market and and, mm. and um, work it that way. But it depends, um, I think, on 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 the game. I mean, I was actually checking the numbers. Um, for example, uh, Last Ninja. Um, three that was released in '91. It actually was sold um, um, 3.5 million, and Last Ninja two and one was sold 5.5 millions. And here we are talking about the Commodore 64, um, which was of course phased out regarding the commercial market. If you compare it to the Amiga. But the Amiga version from La from the Last Ninja 3, for example, was so bad in comparison mm -hmm. that most people bought the C64 version instead because it had that full animated intro. Yeah, and 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 it was a technical marvel. So I think it's clearly depending because the the games you are mentioning they are not like a series. That you can build on, but they were original um, games mm. that that didn't find a second part. Mm. Yes, I mean uh, uh, you say Last Ninja. I mean the music was great, the graphics was amazing. The way how it's displayed is is just you know mind blowing at the time. Um, and they knew they have a good product and they could make a lot of advertisement for it. I mean, the inv investment into uh, marketing is is huge. You have to take a lot of money in your hand or like Elite, for example, at the time by Firebird uh, that uh, or before uh, it, it was uh, on the BBC. Um, 
they they had to take a big risk, but it paid out. And yeah, with a lot of commercial uh, announcements, uh, with with advertisement, uh, you can sell a lot of copies. Just people think, oh yeah, I saw that somewhere, that must be good, so I buy it. And that's where those million of copies come from. Uh, you can't just sell a product without uh, making uh, big big uh, advertisements with it. Yeah. So they were they were cheap on making advertisements. They just saved the money for that. On my game, at least, yes. Ah, so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. But I got my game of the month in the Amiga magazine. I love those guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> you didn't get a Sessler or something? A Sizzler, no, no. A Sizzler, no. exactly. No. I mean, it came out in England as well uh, by... Uh, uh, what's the company called? I can't remember anymore. Um, but uh, it came out in, in, in England uh, a year later. Uh, I, I think also it was just like a, a product for the shelf, not not uh, made a lot of advertisement for it. I don't know how much it, they sold for that, um, but at least it was cool. It, it was it was tested in uh, English magazines. Um, yeah, I mean it, they were they were really good. Yeah, they were, they were really fair with with a product that didn't come out of England. Because it was like, uh, uh, you know, it was it's so much easier if you can go there to the different um, magazines and show the product and show them all the sites, uh, what it does. Uh, that's why you get uh, a bit better rating sometimes. And for that, it was it was really fair. Yeah. Happy with that. Did you ever work on other games after that because that is all um, i didn't find any information that you did another game no. were you so pissed with the publisher experience yes yeah i mean it's different today uh you know with steam and like how it all works that you directly participate of the person who buys your game as developer complete different situation but at a time you know you got the check then you went to the bank and the bank said well it's not covered so sorry can't pay you out and then you have to go back to the publisher and say well your, your check wasn't you know covered said, oh sorry and it's just like these games that they did with you that was horrible you know that's and so yes today it's it's a different uh, story yeah so uh, I mean I, I started again on the Commodore 64 to develop some some prototypes at least yeah. 2006 you wrote actually you returned to the retro scene uh, 16 2016. 2016 yeah so only... actually three years ago yes yeah yeah that's right. so how did that happen oh uh i mean the initial uh um trigger was the the basic 10 liners contest that I just thought, oh yeah, right. Uh, and I guess it has to do with that the device emulator got better. So you know, I didn't really start with the original Commodore 64, playing around with that, but trying out the the emulator, and uh, uh, yeah, that it's like almost like the original thing. <laughs> and then tinkering with basic again, having this nostalgic feeling and. Um, finding out about that contest and said, yeah, that's, that's, that's just the right thing and in a few days. Uh, yeah, and started with that, my first 10-liner in 2016, took part in the contest and I think got second place. That was really cool. And uh, You also yeah. worked with the Polish magazine, Commodore and Amiga Plus, uh, for the One Button Game Special Edition, and you made a little controller for that. Uh, yes, it's another thing that just came with a 10-liner in a way. I think that that firefighter game that they made, it was just simple, you know, plastic space to uh, extinguish the fires. And I thought, you know, like making a product product that is like so simple and so um, how can you make it fun anyway? And then I thought maybe the controllers, that, uh, you know, that people come and... Uh, Get it and uh, try it out. Like my mom, my my uh, uh, you know my kids, they give it a try if it's just a button. So I came came to that idea with the um, single button game controller, 
and found some uh, parts on Alibaba and uh, thought, yeah, how, let's see how that works. And uh, was was also my introduction into soldering. Uh, that was something else at the C64 that you bought one and then maybe it didn't work and you wanted to be able to fix it yourself. So that um, single button game controller was kind of a side project to also, you know, uh, get the tools and learn how to use the tools. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, so one came to the to the next. And the single button game concept is also something that I have it's like familiarities with the Intellivision uh, that uh, Amico that comes out uh, next year. That like the big selling point is the, the controllers of today are too complex. There are like, too many buttons. You know you can't play it with your family because un until they they think they can handle it, it's like the fun is gone. And a button, everybody can use a button. So I made that button for just that reason that people can. Uh, you know, on a party, pick it up, have one uh, beer in the hand, and and play like this. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so, it, if you broke your joystick by too much decathlon uh, games, you can still play these games with just a button. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's just one example. And I I also try to make uh, games that are maybe a bit more complex, but only work with one button. And how do you achieve that? To to make it, um, uh, yeah, that all the controls that you select something from a menu point with one button is not so simple. Uh, or just to have like one button in each hand is a different um, different feel than, than just like having two buttons on the controller. Um, it's like you can you can make funny games like that. Or that yeah, actually, this like, is how, how Nintendo was successful with the Nintendo Wii in 2006 to make a concept of around a console that everybody would play games. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, with, with the button controller, of course, it's only a niche and it's only a, a, a <laughs> fun, fun thing. I'm, I'm not getting rich by that. <laughs> how many were produced? Um, you mentioned that cooperation with uh, Komodo and Amiga Plus. Um, that was quite a good uh, thing. But in the end, uh, all in all, about 70 or 80 uh, buttons I sold so far. Uh, yeah. How, how did you get around to, to work with the Polish people? Um, well, that was... Uh, how did that happen? Was it because of the 10-liner, maybe? He was interested in that story, maybe. I, I can't really remember, but it was like <laughs> starting with the email and then, you know, trying to... Though so they contacted you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, really cool guys working there and uh, yeah, nice magazine as well. Yeah. Yeah, I have to admit, when I did the order, they were constantly emailing me like, don't worry, your order will come out. There's a delay in mastering the tapes and the discs and so on. I'm like, no, no worries. I wasn't worried that somebody would rip me off. But <clears throat> yeah, I mean, also, I mean, if you start something, then you uh, you come across things that you haven't expected, you know, that, uh, you know, the supply chain is failing. And you, you you just believed everything is like working out as you planned and it never does. So <laughs> I think that was also a situation where they tried out a, a new concept, uh, trying to, to sell a product and not realizing what it means. Um, yeah, I also, you know, it, it was for me like sending all my buttons to a place where I don't know, <laughs> will it arrive? Will the customs take it out? Uh, uh, it's a uh, lot of risk involved in that. So, um, yeah, I mean, we learned a lot from that um, project and uh, will help us to, to go to the next step. And this is the cool thing about the scene that you, that you have kind of a, um, uh, acceptance or you, you, you can play around with, with the, the concept. So do you plan to return to game development, maybe with the Amico? Um, as as you mentioned, maybe developing new games. Um, uh, that would be 
such a great opportunity to work for the Army Corps, but uh, I think at the moment uh, um, the, the development studios that are involved, uh, this is like a closed circle and they work uh, uh, on the cover more or less uh, on their games. I don't know how it will develop uh, when it's presented in the next year, if they open up or if they just want to keep their control. Mm. I mean, I wish the the the, um, the concept and the, the console uh, all the best because it's, I think, great to to have this clear picture what they want to be and um, that that it, yeah it, it will be accepted by by everybody that there is a room there's room for that like I multiplayer mean, games yeah i mean you can follow the example of oliver linda or veto which we mentioned earlier who worked for um a starbite he was a graphic guy and he actually did graphics for carmen which is a point and click adventure for the commodore 64 so mm -hmm. he, he also returned to um, commercial C64 um, development. If you look at games like Sam's Journey, that made over 2,000 uh, physical sales yeah. for Commodore 64. Yeah. Maybe there is maybe there is a market there or a reason to return to Aha, game well, development. You know? Well, the, the Commodore 64 is a different uh, thing. Yes, I mean I'm. I'm my, that's part of my hobby now, you know, that I'm, yeah. I'm developing for the Commodore 64. And on one way, I, I would like to make a Traps and Treasures, but on Commodore 64, kind of a D-make or like a, a related to it. Doesn't need to have the same name, but uh, the same hero kind of, or the same kind of gameplay, it's like an action adventure, jump and run platformer with uh, puzzles. That was, uh, was the special thing about Traps and Treasures. And uh, you know the prototype works fine. Um, just need time to go go further into it. Yeah. And uh, there are some other prototypes uh, in my drawers that uh, I can't talk about, but they're really really cool. And um, with a bit of time, yeah, you will see the seed of uh, the see the the light of it. Eventually. Actually, on your blog, you mentioned you did some work on Leonardo too, but that never was released. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, Leonardo wasn't a clown, and I think in the circus he was a clown, and uh, maybe that's why I mix it up with Clownomania because Clownomania was like the same character in a way with that big nose. nose. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Me knowing only the Commodore 64 uh, version um, in the intro because the graphics were converted so badly in a way, I thought this. Um, this person that is going to get into the house is actually a rat, mm -hmm. but no, it was a teenage boy with a with a cap, a baseball cap, you know. Yeah, on the but Amiga version, you can that. see. You couldn't see yeah. that on the Commodore 64. Yes, it looked yeah. like a rat with two big, <laughs> two big ears or something like, you know. Yeah. And Rolling Ronnie, uh, the, my contribution there was uh, more passive. I uh, for Traps and Treasures, I built my own level editor, level ed, and that was also used for Rolling Runny. Yeah. And the, yeah, the, the big, uh, oh, one of the stories that, that hit me was that Starbite said in a magazine, I think it was the Octela Software Markt, uh, said, all oh, right, uh, final Traps and Treasures, uh, Traps and Treasures won't be um, a pirate, it will be Rolling Runny maybe on skates, uh, doing the same thing. Completely didn't interact, uh, didn't include me in what they planned, but sold it to the press and it was printed. Ew. So, I mean, they, they just released, I think in 91, the Rolling Ronnie, and that was like, you know, got maybe looked cool. And then I just thought, well, we change, we change the story of Traps and Treasures to something, you know, this is our, our Sonic, this is our, Mario, so we have like this rolling runny uh, kind of mentality, and uh, uh, yeah, it it hit me really, it hurt me that my you know the the, the first thing I wa was making was the the hero, the the pirate, and uh, I always when I make any applications, I build the icon first. For me, this is like the spirit to to start with, or 
uh, like to give like the, the impulse for and the hero and they wanted to replace that so it was just like bang thank you That's, I don't need that no I'm trying to finish a game here and it, you just pull the carpet under my feet so was, yeah, was I mean, that before the game was released yeah course. yeah that was before okay it was in the middle of, of 91 and 93 wow. it was finally released so uh, yeah fun <laughs> so <laughs> it was released one year before Commodore actually went bankrupt. That's interesting. Yes, and, and at the time, when I heard it from Starbucks themselves, they said, well, Commodore doesn't look so good. We need to get the game out because, you know, the market goes goes down. I just said, no, because the Commodore 64 was like, you know, like over 12, how many years still successful? Amiga only came out in 85, 86. Uh, that, 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 that's, that's a lie. They just tried to, you know, try to put pressure on me uh, uh, in a way uh, but yes I mean uh, maybe they knew something that uh, uh, the, the, the the publishers among themselves were, were gossiping yeah hmm. interesting yeah I mean, I mean um, the, the story that I will never forget is actually that um, that the final commercial game release on the Commodore 64 was Lemming. Lemmings, the game that was told to be never be able to actually be released on the Commodore 64 because of the limited cap tip, uh, uh, of the limited um, possibilities of the yeah. hardware. So um, I, I think that was really, really interesting for, for me to see that um, this was the final commercial game. And actually, back in the time, 80, uh, no, 90s, 93, as you mentioned, there was a race if, May if, if Mayhem in Monsterland would be released first or Lemmings. <laughs> there was actually a, a race between the two games, yeah. which would come first. And um, as we all know nowadays, Mayhem and Monsterland came first, and Lemmings was the last game, and actually also the, the last game that Yerontel did music for. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how the cycle closed. And uh, two years ago, I was actually uh, interviewing Mike Clark from Psychosis, and I asked him why did they actually re release a game on a dead market. And he said, because the Dutch developers finished it and it was just another platform to support. They wanted to be able to tick it on a list and say, yeah, now it works on the Commodore 64 too. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's quite interesting stories yeah. to hear, you know? Yeah. That, um, well, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so many new games are coming out nowadays, and uh, it's very exciting that that Tau scene uh, uh, wakes up, and all the developers from the the 80s, 90s, uh, uh, you know, can can still use their their knowledge and have an audience, and this this is an exciting time at the at the moment. But of course, of course, Sam's journey with 2,000 sold copies is uh, is an exception. Yes, you have yeah. to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Normally, you can be happy if you sell if you sell two thousand, uh, two hundred copies, you know, of mm -hmm. a game. So, um, I just wonder what the the C, the C sixty four Maxi uh, will do with the market. If that actually, has a... actually, uh, it's called the sixty four, and the mini is called the mini. Oh, okay, well, it's sold with Moxie at the uh, in the stores, Amazon and everywhere. <laughs> I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, 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 because it's easier so, to sell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> but the official name is the the C sixty four from the Kickstarter yeah, campaign, probably. Yeah. Indiegogo campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it it the name was even different at the beginning, right? Yeah, and, um, yeah it was um, the sixty four, and then they renamed it to Mini. And then they decided that the bigger version will be having the original name. Yeah. So kind of back yeah. and forth between the names, you know. Um, no, but, but good on them as well that they, you know, keep keep uh, going and they they that they will deliver. No, it's uh, it's not easy to to do this, uh, you know, with so much pressure in the in the scene and. Uh, well, it worked uh, with the DTV. I mean, it, they sold so many copies of that joystick mm -hmm. with the Commodore 64 
inside. And uh, as most people don't know, there wasn't actually planned an, an European version. It was just an NTSC version. And then it was sold over um, um, QVC. And then most people calling for buying this um, device were actually not from America, but from Europe. So yeah, most yeah. units were sold not in the target market. And then they yeah. got like, wow, so, so maybe maybe we should do a, a Paul version after all, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's quite interesting, yeah. Yeah. But the, the new one, you know, he with its own keyboard, it has its own charm. And yeah, maybe it makes a difference compared to the... Yeah, the thing in the Indiegogo took place and Darren Mailburn, you know, the original inventor of the DTV, he, he, he was the project manager and made it up, you know. Um, most seniors were actually like skeptical if this is um, vaporware, you know. And mm -hmm. I remember at this time, we were the, the first people that interviewed him for our podcast, actually. And we would do the interview while he was in Spain for holidays. Yeah. <laughs> so he could he could get the story out. So the scene was very skeptical at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But you're right. In in the end, the mini the mini sold better than than anybody um, thought it would. Yeah. And it's also opening a new market for for the masses, people who don't know about the scene. Yeah, I mean, I, I program games for the C64 or I, I do something and it's really hard to show someone because either you have no monitor, you can hook a C64 on because the the, the conversion is so bad with all those, uh, or it's, it's really expensive to have that. And I think with the the new um, the six, the C64, um, this, these problems are all solved in a way. You know, yeah, it's it, HDMI. HDMI and you can send uh, uh, maybe sell sell a USB stick you know with your game on it and it's easy that people can enjoy your game without much effort and that makes a big difference. That's true. That's true. So maybe we can get you back into the developing uh, scene. I would be happy to uh, you know um, uh, yeah so just start start again. Uh, I'll try again. <laughs> so, so what do you do nowadays? You're not coding anymore. Uh, no, no, I'm I'm working full time for a, a global um, insurance company, and uh, also in IT. Uh, okay. Keeps me busy. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I take my holidays to do my hobby in a way. Okay. So do you still know how to make a sampler? Yeah, sure. Yes, you never forget. It's like uh, driving, riding a bike. Riding a si bicycle, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, honestly, it took me a while uh, to get back into it. But but a 6502 or 6510 assembler is not that difficult. It's it's more difficult to get your library back together with all these helper um, functions and uh, tables and. Uh, you know, you can only add and subtract and everything else you have to, to work out yourself. Well, the good thing is you started um, developing on the Amiga. You got the tools. When you talk to people who did um, VCS games or Commodore 64 games, they didn't have any tracker or um, professional program to yeah. make graphics or sounds on. They had to write their tools first. Yes, yes. So uh, even high respect to all these uh, early pioneers who, uh, uh, you know, worked it out themselves and, um, you know, made something unbelievable. Like the, the David Crane is pitfall, setting a completely new genre with that game. Uh, and, you know, he said, um, well, if, if you don't have enough uh, RAM on the standard cartridge, we just, you know, pop it up and uh, work it out that way and the, the scrolling and everything that he managed mm -hmm. on the uh, on the Atari 2600 it's at the time and on these constraints and restrictions it's it's amazing yeah 
And I, I also love to to learn about history of the old uh, developments and um, early games, and this this is also very fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I learned during those interviews there are two type of people. Um, one think like nobody's interested in that. Actually, three types. Or um, people say they don't want to talk about the past. <laughs> let it be. Let it yes. be. <laughs> Maybe they just say because they can't remember that well. <laughs> yeah. But yes, it's uh, it's really cool. Like I mean, I mean, if you if you didn't approach me via Twitter um, prior to to um, to meeting us at Gamescom, I wouldn't even um, well having had this idea of making this interview today. Because there were so many names involved, you cannot know everybody, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just have to tell the story how it happened. You know, I we didn't uh, uh, know each other before that, and just before Gamescom, I I made it uh, blackjack in basic uh, listing because I thought, yeah, that's probably quite cool to to have this old nostalgic feeling again to type in a listing yourself. On a Commodore 64, so I I developed a, a new blackjack with a, a special graphic mode that makes it look a bit nicer than the standard uh, uh, blackjacks that you already know. Anyway, I uh, then just before Gamescom started, I I my wife said, "Oh, why are you not, why are, why are you not going? Because you you're a gamer." And I said, "Well, no, I'm not so sure. It's far away. It costs a lot of money." But then I thought, well, maybe I can bring two things together. And, uh, you know, I asked Christian Kleinser first, because I knew he had a stand there, if he's happy to uh, put that listing for, for a takeaway or a giveaway. He said, well, not really, but uh, I know it's not, not really going with my, my theme, but I know, like, the, the scene world next uh, to me. They, mm -hmm. They're just doing that kind of showing kids or showing young people uh, or who anybody who's interested how you can code basic and uh, it was just meant to happen that that we we have to meet and so I took my my copies of, of listings to the gamescom and you were so so kind to to show it there and uh, I didn't know who you are and you didn't know who I am so, yeah. I was. <laughs> so it's, it's really funny how it worked out and in the meantime I watched all your uh, no not all but <laughs> I've read all your books. As well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many, many of your interviews, and it's so interesting. Yeah, and yeah, I, I can't get enough of just uh, the historical aspect of games. And uh, yeah, you're you're doing a good part of that. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for for doing that. And uh, the, all the, the people from Scene World who who do a great job uh, keeping the scene alive and bringing you know yeah. the states. Uh, the, the, the states and Europe together. Next, it's, it's next really... year we are doing this for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. And if you look back, many people that we interviewed are still not, are even not alive anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, in a way sad, but it's also good that we preserve the story, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because some people were pretty old when we interviewed them 20 years ago, you know. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, and that is what, what, um, what many people don't understand, that basically, <coughs> basically um, this home computer thing started in 1977. That's like 42 years ago. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, with Pat, you know, and all this stuff. So um, it was not only the fax machine that was invented in 1977. It was also <laughs> the home computers that came to life. Mm. Yeah, big step. Yeah. yeah. It's also the 70s where people, uh, not uh, 70s, where things like toasters were invented and all that electrical devices that makes your life so easy nowadays, you know? Yeah. And I mean, in the 80s, you didn't, you wouldn't think that it will grow into a industry, the whole gaming business. That's just. Uh, I, I, uh, re I remember when I was a small, a small child, and the compact disc was just released, and um, then it was finally 
coming to the mass market in 86. And my mom was like, we have to get, we have to get a CD player. <laughs> I want to have a CD player. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, that was the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And and then in 89, when I was seven, my mom urged us to go to the electronic store and get the microwave. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm missing these things a bit, like this, this one killer product that you just have to have because it fills a gap. And nowadays, I, it seems not to be like that anymore. 2007, iPhone? Yeah, of course. Uh, and 2008, everybody had to have Android them. phones. So it kicked kicked off the smartphone market for the masses. Yeah. Because before 2007 or 2008 for Android, it was just BlackBerry. And who yeah. had BlackBerry's business people? Mm. Yeah. But, you know, in the 80s, it's per, almost every year there was something new. And I know. It was really yeah. fast uh, growing, yeah, evolving. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, we got a we got a VHS recorder in um, eighty one. It was Dario, four thousand German marks, mm. four thousand German marks. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, nobody would spend so much money on an electronic device. You know, mm. no, no way. Mm. I mean, I mean, look at smartphones, um, one one thousand four hundred euros for the um, biggest iPhone, and that's still cheaper than the VHS recorder from nineteen eighty one. Yeah, I don't know, but you know it, that, that whole uh, scene that's growing with the C sixty four and that this, this is. Maybe going into ph philosophical part, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like fixing your your Commodore 64 because you you replace a few um, um, how do you say condensatoren uh, uh, condensers? Yeah, probably. And it's running again. It's like yeah, you can help yourself with those uh, old machines, and uh, you you can if if that doesn't work, you can FPGA. Uh, um the chip and and make make old systems still run and so i just wonder like all these host systems or uh that you know banks use and can't replace because there's so much uh, uh important stuff daily running over that that they will just emulate that and it it continues the, the software made like 30 40 years ago um will still be able to run in 200 years time because people know how to do that and that software that you made will always live on. It's like interesting that um, uh, that software doesn't age. It, it's it's not getting worse because it's uh, it's old. If it does the job right, I mean, yeah, keep it like that. Hmm. I mean, I'm I'm not talking about all these uh, influences of of. Uh, <laughs> uh, how you can can infiltrate the system or so, but um, yeah, if if you've got a closed system and it works, I mean, then keep it alive and um, you know find ways, make the tools to to uh, keep it alive. And yeah, for example, up. for example, I remember I don't, I don't know, like five years ago, I don't know what year it was, when somebody after over twenty years found a way to work around the CD drive of a Sega CD. That, mm -hmm. that, was, that was an amazing moment. When he actually found out that the interface um, for, for a video um, multi a multimedia card can actually be used to, to catch the data that is used to control the, the CD drive and and capture that and then um, fake the fake the system into thinking that you are a CD drive while mm -hmm. you aren't you are a flash drive but since since there are no since there are um, almost no replacement CD drives for this machine available anymore and they are not produced new it's it's pretty hard so um yeah so and and think about all those arcade machines 
um, where, where um, batteries were on it that leaked. Yeah. So it would destroy all the ICs. So some some games are not available complete anymore because graphic data is missing or whatever. So mm. um, there's still some preservation work that needs to be to be done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think if if there is like some you know, some heart in it, then people will make it work. I mean, there's always someone that spends his time for, uh, you know, maybe minor things uh, or unimportant mm-hmm. things. But in the end, uh, it will, if, if if he believes in it, that it, it will become something special. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm pretty sure in the future we have, uh, we, we, we still have a, a good set of, um, of history that we can experience uh, the way we, we used to live it with it. But because everything is nowadays digital, you're not relying on um, on VHS tapes anymore. Mm. <laughs> you know, and and then and then when I look when I look at badly digi- digitized VHS video recordings on YouTube, I'm thinking like I have could I have. Could, uh, I could have done this better, and yeah. it hurts. It hurts me. It hurts me when I see a VHS recording with so bad, bad sound that I think this this cannot be so bad in the original recording, you know. Or or you know this VHS problem, the track alignment of the yeah. picture. If you didn't do it right, the picture would would be not stable. And yeah. would roll over all the time, or you would have a white line on the top, because but, you weren't you were too lazy to align the tape correctly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know if, if other people agree at my age, but I think we watched movies in that quality, like ninety minute movies, and we we loved it. It wasn't a problem because there were most of them like that because you had a copy of someone's. Uh, you know, copy, and that was just the way you could get. Yeah. You know, to, to, it was the only way to see it, and you loved it. So yeah, it was like accepted. It wasn't a problem. Yeah. I I I I still have it. I have my um my VHS recorder, um, which is a VR six 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 from Philips, which is a high end device, um, from ninety seven, and uh, it has an automatic cleaning for the heads it yeah. has an automatic uh, track analyzing so um, whenever I when whenever I insert a VHS tape it would autom- automatically find the correct alignment for the picture so if you mm-hmm. had a really good device um, you could get a pretty decent picture but but let's face it many people back uh, in the days they weren't tech gurus and as long as they weren't getting sick by watching the picture they they didn't really bother if there was a a white line on the top of it you know yeah yeah and you know that's why we went to the cinema because that was like the quality that you paid for and at home you know home video wasn't like the same so the, the um the, the motivation to go to the cinemas was was because of that because he wanted good quality. Uh, that's not the case anymore today. Mm, but but let's face it: if the film role was played often, the quality wasn't <coughs> wasn't so good anymore uh, for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just have to you know make it uh, put it into relation for you know thirty mm. years ago, and uh, yeah, also that was was a different uh, problem right? I, and I, I remember that when when in 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 80 and in 2008 when I was in in Sofia um the first time I was in Bulgaria and you know Bulgaria was just part of the EU three years earlier so everything was still like you know um Soviet style you know but the cinema was brand new a skyscraper <laughs> The walls full of glass, modern modern technology, you know, 
and the picture difference between digital and analog between Germany, my cinema in my city, and and uh, Bulgaria was just mind blowing. Yeah. I've never seen such a sharp picture in a cinema before, you know. But yeah. that is because it was um, just put up and yeah. they invested in the best technology. I, I think, the at least in Germany, the big leap forward to good quality was actually Avatar that also yeah. started um, a kickoff for 3D movies. Yeah. I don't know how it was in Switzerland, but but when Avatar was released, cinemas in Germany were forced to modernize. I don't know if they uh, had to, uh, you know, had to do it, or if they uh, if they if they had a choice or not. I I don't remember that. Yeah, but I mean, you just think about the the big impact of the the change. You know, they see it digital and see like the quality. On the other hand, I think you get used to that quite quickly and it wears off seeing perfectness and then you know it's it's not the same feel it's not the same excitement anymore even if it's like super clear and super sharp and uh yeah it's only in, in the moment of a change where you think wow and then it's just like you Normal. you're in the same same position as before yeah right. <laughs> yeah I mean, there must be a reason why nowadays records that are now called vinyls are re-released, you know, and you can get new, you can get new vinyl players to yes. buy on on, 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 on on Amazon or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's amazing, you know, and it, it even has, they, they even have versions where, where you have um, outputs so you can put it on your analog st stereo. You know, mm -hmm. I still have my my first stereo from childhood, from '92. I yeah. I know I was 10 and I got my first stereo, and I still use it and it still works. And now, um, three years ago, I actually connected a digital radio receiver to it, but it yeah. still works. You know, yeah. and it's it's amazing to see that nowadays uh, musicians are releasing new music tapes. Mm -hmm. and music records that's yeah. that's really um really crazy because in 86 when the audio city was taking off people were trying to switch as soon as possible yeah. and not imagine to go back to record or tape music yeah. Yeah. and now I, people go back to that i mean also with the you know the game that you bought in the 80s you bought it because of the cover you know, it was like uh, a way to um, to go into a dreamland. It's just the game could be crap or like uh, really bad, but you still had that image of of wow, this is the the thing. And and I think also so with records have that um, charm that it's like because it's the big plate, um, you have a lot of space to present your cover, you present your your poster and uh, the band or whatever, and this had this different appeal to a CD that does isn't not so uh, in such a format. Um, yeah, that's, I just think every medium, every thing has its has its spirit, has its uh, uh, beauty, and um, yeah, you shouldn't make one thing down because of the other thing. It's just a different way to. You present something, and that's why I cherish all these old, old uh, video games and old old computers. I collect uh, video consoles from the past. Or I mean, I still got mine from from the 80s, 90s um, at home. Uh, also, I've got a, a Technics amplifier, and uh, yeah, like mine is also a Technics stereo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. still uh, works. Yes. The only thing, the only thing my my grandfather had to repair like 15 years ago or something, that was actually um, the tape tape deck mm -hmm. would would need smearing because mm -hmm. it wouldn't. Yeah, the wouldn't rubber and able... everything is yeah, uh, exactly. getting yeah, dried yeah. out and so. Yeah. But if you know. If you have the tools and you know how where the problem is, you can actually fix it. That's the the cool thing about it. Uh, and what I uh, what I didn't know at the time, you know, I had a, um, a hard disk next to my Amiga 500 where I programmed my traps and treasures on it, and I used that hard disk to um, you know uh, compile and and uh, 
um, as um, yeah, prepare the game. And I had pictures, Deluxe Paint pictures, and everything on there. I I made some backups, but I don't. I'm not really sure that I made a a, a backup uh, at that time. Uh, I think it was maybe 2000. Uh, no, it was later, maybe 2000 and 2003. And I switched on my my computer again with my hard disk, and phew, you know it went up in 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 a big smoke. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that it's only like one of those uh, uh, condensers. Cap- uh, okay, caps Capa- yeah. Cap- capacitors. Yeah, yeah, capacitors. Oh God, yes. And that's why uh, that's why this process of of changing the capacitors is called recapping. Yeah, exactly. Ah. <laughs> so we got it. And we nerds and we forgot the word. Yeah, sorry. No sorry. problem. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to, to, to the yeah, other Actually, actually interesting to mention it. You are you are one of the few people from Switzerland that actually are from the German area. I spoke to people in, in my demo scene uh, time, crackers and the on, and they were all from the French or the Italian part of Switzerland. So it's actually, uh, you're one of the few people that um, are actually from Zurich, from the German part of Switzerland. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, we've got uh, a few few ones here that uh, have quite a cool history. Yeah. So anyway, back to the story. Yeah, it, yeah. Blow, it blew up. Yeah, a big smoke. And uh, for me, uh, of course, the whole room smelled like... Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you know the smell. And yeah. for me, it was just like, okay, uh, it's broken. So I threw it away, more or less. Yeah. I didn't yes. try to fix it. And I throw it away, get it by new uh, kind of society. I, I know this too. Yeah. Yeah. For, for me, it was just like, uh, if it's, if it goes up in flames, you can't fix it in a way. And yes, as you say, you, you're not used to it anymore that you should have a close, a second opinion or second look to it. And like big, big uh, TVs, you know, that, that just don't work anymore. They're thrown away, but it's only a capacitor maybe that needs to be replaced. And I learned that with the C64, because this is like uh, something to to find out how how does that machine work and open it and look at it and and uh, watching YouTube videos nowadays it's so easy to make yourself a, a picture but uh, in 2003 I didn't have that knowledge or and I just uh, threw it away and I don't know if my latest source code from Traps and Treasures was on there or what uh, what else I lost. I mean, it was before the scene woke up again. At the time, everybody threw their old games away and uh, uh, their computers, and uh, only later people started to buy it again. To which, which actually is the reason why many things are getting rare. I mean, after 12 years, I finally found an original of Last Ninja 3 on disc, which is a verity itself because System 3 is British and the British mostly only wanted tape. They never yeah. wanted disc because yeah. disc was twice as much expensive and the British were cheap. Yeah. They would rather have longer loading times but cheaper games. Yeah. You know? yeah, and uh, um, I was lucky. I was lucky because it, it was sold in Germany on eBay Germany only in German only shipping to Germany and there were only three people next to me bidding on it. So I got it for 92 euros. That yeah. was quite quite nice because normally this game is sold around 150 euros. Yeah. So it was quite an okay price yeah. for this kind of game. Yeah. But if, if people didn't throw their stuff away in the 90s, they wouldn't be so sought after. <clears throat> sort after nowadays. Yeah. I mean, I saw the um, on eBay. Ah. Yeah. Oh. That's the, that's the original. Yeah. Um, One megabyte Amiga required. Okay. Yeah. But it runs on Amiga 500. So that's, uh, you know, nowadays the, the Amiga games that are coming out are much more um, demanding. Yeah. And it had eight way scrolling. So, but anyway, um, yeah, someone offered that on eBay for thousand four hundred uh, uh, euro. Your game. 
Yes. <laughs> but I mean, nobody will buy it for that price. It's like uh, crazy. I mean, it's, uh, it's not, but it is quite rare. So everybody who's got the copy, um, yeah, uh, well done. Yeah. And, but, but yours is original or did you have to buy it again from somewhere? No, no, I was sent 10 copies when, you know, the whole thing was going well. And so I thought, okay, um, uh, yeah. We, we send them a, a nice uh, thank you after all. I mean, they, they had a, a product manager that wasn't, uh, you know, didn't do the contract. Uh, he, he didn't do the contract with me, but it was like working towards the game. I always also wrote it in the blog. And uh, I also want to thank this this guy um, that it, uh, it was really helpful to have someone on my side uh, for once. And he sent me <laughs> a, a box for uh, with, with 10 copies. Uh, just for me to give my friends and nice, uh, nice. yeah so this is from the very early days one of the first releases and traps and tra traps and treasures yeah interesting interesting yeah. yeah and nowadays you could reproduce it probably with the nowadays possibilities i guess the hardest problem would be to find the discs empty diskettes that you could use Oh, That's probably think, the hardest. Uh, these uh, three and a half uh, inch uh, discs are probably not so rare. Uh, but they are DD discs for the Amiga. Amiga didn't do HD like the PC. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I don't know, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's. it's uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you can still play the game today, and so uh, yeah, either you have the original or you you play digital. I think. Yeah, yeah. most people have a CF card reader. In their Amigas and just yeah, use yeah. it that way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. interesting. I, oh. I learned a lot today. Oh my god. Oh, me too. And it was a really interesting talk. Yeah, cool. <laughs> oh, let's face it. You know so much more about the old times than me. Oh, uh, only only my my four uh, walls maybe, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, no. My disadvantage is I was born in 82, so I was very, very small. So my my knowledge starts maybe at 1990, nine, 1990, when I got my own C64, and then I can relate to that time. But before I was eight, I cannot really remember much from my childhood. Yeah, I mean, same for me. It's, it's too too early. Yeah. But uh, because of all the cool movies, you know, Indiana Jones, uh, Back to the Future. Uh, the new Rambo. The, uh... the first Rambo uh, <laughs> was great. Uh, and yeah, it's just like, uh, yeah, super, super cool time. And you, when you were at the teenage years, yeah. Uh, I was more the teenager in the 90s. Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe you can do a, a whole 90s uh, uh, brush up of, of what happened at that decade and uh, I, I, rem I, rem I remember I remember George Lucas re-releasing um, a remastered edition of the um, first Star Wars movie on VHS tape. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. still have the gold edition in my cupboard, you know? Yeah. And I remember um, that um, 97 Jurassic Park 2 was released and I, I went with my father in the cinema. I had to see it. Yeah. 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 And I remember the first movie I ever saw as a kid was in 94, The Flintstones. <laughs> yeah, Which, so cool. um, yeah. That, that was actually... That's, those are my two that I remember, you know, Jurassic Park 2 with Jeff Goldblum and and um, and um, Flintstones. Yeah, totally, totally amazing. Yeah. yeah, you didn't have to see the 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 Super Mario Brothers movie, hopefully. Oh, I I, <laughs> I, I have it on blue. <clears throat> Sorry, I I'm I have it on Blu-ray nowadays, mm -hmm. but it's so bad. It's so bad. It's I, I really <clears throat> I really much more enjoyed Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Than, that, um, that I remember well too, yeah. 
just an animation character with real, real yeah. uh, movie. That was a yeah game changer. But but but, but had the same had the same actor. In uh, it. Yeah, if I can remember his name, wasn't it Bob Hop- Hopkins? Yes, it was. Unfortunately, he's dead now. But yeah, yeah, he was Super Mario in the movie, and he was the detective in the Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's actually interesting because I knew the game before because of a, a school friend that I swapped discs with for the Commodore 64, despite it was forbidden to to swap uh, the illegal disc copies in the school, but we did it, we did it anyway. And um, yeah, that was crazy times. And, and I remember when... Um, when uh, um, 86, we uh, we got Winra and we got uh, 20 discs and we put Duke Nukem 3D on it. And yeah. then uh, we were 15, but, uh, you know, we didn't bother if the game was 18 plus. Mm-hmm. And, and then I remember one year later, 97, when um, the the library of the school actually had a computer in it. And they got um, they got Tom, uh, Tomb Raider, mm-hmm. Tomb Raider, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, now the relation to Switzerland, I always found that Laura Croft, her arguments looked like from top of, from top of her own chocolate. <laughs> you <Okay>. know, <laughs> because the graphic abilities weren't so good in the polygon graphic, you know. <laughs> And my yeah. first thought as a teenager was like, where did they get, where did they get her her upper upper body from? From Switzerland or something, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Metal Gear and uh, Tomb Raider on PS One. That was just uh, yeah. absolutely. Perfect. And I was a big yeah. fan of Destruction Derby. Yeah. From '95, uh, and I actually was glad to hear that. Um, one year later, 94, was the PlayStation released. And one year later, they made a PC version um, mm-hmm. out of it. That that was so great. Mm-hmm. That was mm-hmm. so wonderful, yeah. So um, I, I, that, that, that are the 90s for me. And, and this is also where, where I got uh, actually access to the whole library of C64 games, you know, because um, 96 friends were actually sending me CDs with D64 images. And suddenly I, I played games like Leonardo, Zack McCracken, Maniac Mansion, and I learned about all the classics, you know. Yeah. And then, and then in 2008, when I started with eBay, I had access to originals. Yeah, oh my yeah. God, you know. Yeah. And uh, but it still, it still hurts that it took, um, it took me 12 years almost to find a, a disc version of Last Ninja 3. Yeah. So, uh, whoa. Uh, well done. Uh, yeah. You know, it makes it more valuable that way. Uh, did you actually ever work on a C64 game commercially? You didn't, right? Only uh, Amiga. Uh, yes, yeah. I only did Amiga, yeah. yeah. Too bad, too bad. But that's that's why I'm, you know, like happy to step back and uh, go go back to the to the roots. Uh, I think Zauberschloss was just like a eye opener at the time, like a type in listing uh, that. You you were in the 3D world in the 3D castle and uh, that left some kind of memory. As as I said before, it has its own charm and um, <laughs> the C64. And happy to come back to to this. Yeah, I'm much happier to develop a new game for the C64 than for the Commodore Amiga. To be honest. Yeah. yeah. I, I was never an Amiga kid. I was C64. Yeah, and it's. Yeah, it's a purity. It's just like this, uh, you know, you don't, you can't do multiplication in the assembly. You can't do great things, whereas, uh, yeah, and, and the sound chip, of course, of the C64, that makes it so characteristic. But when the Amiga came out, I mean, it, it, it could play digital sound, but for me, it was a bit a disappointment that that kind of ability of this character that the C64 had got a bit lost with the Amiga sounds-wise. Uh, no, no filter. 
but you heard all these Obaski uh, sounds uh, uh, later, the same instruments you reused hundred times. Uh, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it, it made the Amiga sound in the end, uh, but yeah, it it was not the same as as, as the C64. So that's why I made now. Uh, yeah, I'm quite happy on that platform now. It's cool stuff. And now you're going back to Ami 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 Amico, maybe in the future. Yeah, I mean, th this is just like a big dream. But uh, I mean, I'm happy with the scene. I mean, it's it's good enough. I don't want to to do stress work again. It's just like <laughs> I mean, I'm finished when I'm finished, and uh, it's not commercially. It's just like for fun, and uh, this works for me. And you can get a game out uh, uh, that is. You know, very simple, like like the ten liners that I'm I'm I made. Uh, there is an audience that likes that kind of thing, and um, yeah, that's really fun. Then for both sides, you know, for the makers and the the, the consumers. Yeah. But I would really I would really enjoy it if you made another game in assembler. I mean. Sam's journey can't be beaten, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, it's coming out for the NES soon, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, also, like, what, what you see now, the, the shoot em ups you know, it's, like, really high level uh, what they bring out of the C64. A another new level compared to the, to the old days. Uh, but, you know, I can't compete with that. I will never do, be able to, and so I just find. You, know, you don't have to. Yeah, no, but it's it's more like okay, I I have to work in a um, me game mechanics environment that nobody else you know found. Uh, I want to bring something new to the to the scene also, and not not like trying to be uh, best technically because that's that's not uh, you know. You you you're always beaten again by someone else, and I, I just do, do something for the art of it. You know, some people might like it, some people don't. But uh, if I had fun doing it, then there must be something in it. Like kind of. I, and then you hire Yeruntel for the music. For example, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I would be happy to have a. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, all I mean, the big, big, uh, I mean, looking looking at the com <clears throat> at the Commodore 64. You have it a lot easier. You have a database where you can um, look at how our disk speeders are done. You have fast loaders that work on all drives. You know, you have routines that you didn't have before. You don't have to worry about copy protection anymore. Yeah. So, um, but for me, somehow, you know, I, I say. Um, okay, I want to make a game like Traps and Treasures. It needs full, uh, always crawling, eight, eight ways crawling. I figure it out how it works. I, I'm not going into a, a already made code to find out how it someone okay. made it. This is my this is my uh, ambition, you know, to work okay. it out myself, like the old days. And the yeah. same for, for the sit routine, like a sit player. I haven't programmed my own Zit player, but this is something that I really want to do. Okay. And, uh, you know, maybe when I struggle and come to, I ask someone, but um, looking at someone else's code, this is for me like cheating a bit, or like okay. uh, taking a shortcut that it doesn't help me because I want to learn why things don't work and you have to work it out yourself. It yeah. takes a longer, it's a longer way to, to get to the goal, but it's more um, substantial in the end. Yeah, it's, it's it's true. I mean, pe knowledge is getting lost. I mean, how many people still know nowadays how to uh, how to uh, program a needle printer? You know, yeah. how how do needle printer commands work? You know, and, I'm sure you um, can look it up on YouTube. <laughs> and um, so, as I said, you want to make a demake of Trap and Treasures for the Commodore 64. I really hope you will. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try try my best. <laughs> you can make a Kickstarter. Everybody is making a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign nowadays, asking no. for money. I think um, the guys that are behind Sam's journey did it right, you know. Do it behind the curtains, and when it's finished, then go out with it. I'm not such a fan of, you know, showing an idea and then get the money and, you know. You know, I promised 
promised so much to Starbite and I couldn't deliver. And I know how things can go wrong, you know, family change, whatever. Um, uh, you never know and, and rather work, work behind the scenes and then present it when it's finished or it's, it's, it wasn't meant to be, we see the light of day. Yeah, well, that's my opinion. Yeah. I will keep asking you for the next years. <laughs> next years, next years. No demos, no, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so what's your next plan after your Gamescom um, adventure? Anything coming up for the retro scene? Um, I mean, what uh, Christian Kleinser and I are a bit focusing is that whole listing um, scene that thing can can do a bit more. I mean, I like to to write games in basic. I don't know why this is, but it has its own, you know, also awesome. yeah, and the spirit is whatever. But uh, coming from the ten liner scene, you can do beauty in a little really small space. And my thing, for example, is like to do a three page listing at not much more. So you can print uh, a four like a, a three folded uh, fold a three paper with three pages of listing that you can do in a couple of hours that uh, not and with as as a uh, um, few data lines as possible so there's a lot of uh, basic code that you can actually understand or trying to understand or see what's going on and how the game is made so there's kind of a bit of education in it there's a bit of um, you know, cleverness maybe about the algorithms it's used. It's it's all like uh, 30 years of experience that I put in those listings and uh, hope the people um, who are typing and running it, uh, they, they feel that and, and, and see again um, that a good game, I mean, the game should look nice and feel nice and sound nice that, and, and it's in, in made in basic. Uh, this is all like something that I say, well, that works for me. I hope it works for others. So this is something that I maybe um, do a bit more, some kind of basic listings uh, that, as I presented uh, at Gamescom, thanks to you. And uh, Christian, <laughs> uh, Christian is coming out with this basic Weihnachten, you know, that uh, Christmas magazine that he made last year for the Forum 64 community. Yeah. And it was really, really cool. And I hope uh, that he will be as successful as last year. And I guess it, so, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, with the new Commodore 64 coming out, maybe there's a new target audience that will find its way yeah. into the forums, and uh, the community can grow by then. Why not? Why not working on the demake of Trap and Treasures, getting Oliver Lindau helping with the graphics? You know, old old <laughs> Starbite buddy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll see. Uh, uh, I'm open to everything. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and they are all at Gamescom as well. So you can do a live coding session at night after Gamescom or something. <laughs> well, let's see. I mean, the plan is to visit again next year. It was a cool experience, but the whole week this time. Nah, I'm not sure. No, I'm. I'm have to. Uh, don't ask me now. <laughs> 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 yeah, if I have a whole. Uh, a suitcase of cool stuff to show then i'm happy to to do something but at the moment you know we'll see um, lots of work to do anyway and family is also taking time can't promise anything yeah the, the, the special thing ab about this is about you is you keep it all on your blog the history part of it so you seem to be pretty <clears throat> i'm pretty proud of it and keep keep the memory alive uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, when when you have fun with something that uh, share it with the world. It's uh, uh, all my songs are on the on the um, kingroman.com uh, site um, the, that I made uh, on the Amiga. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm proud of what I did. I mean, there are some some tunes that are not finished, but they they have something. Yeah. I think, and uh, why not, uh, you know, share this rest. Yeah. Great, thanks a lot. So I hope we will keep in touch and see you again next year in summer at Gamescom. <laughs> Let's see, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> bye bye. Bye. <laughs> yeah.